Welcome to the Real News Network in Baltimore. I'm Kim Brown. It was revealed on Thursday that the European Union's border agency Frontex has been targeting vulnerable migrants for intelligence gathering. Civil Liberties Monitoring Group State Watch reported on Thursday that the guidelines produced for border guards instruct the targeting of migrants from minority ethnic groups and individuals who may have been isolated or mistreated during their journey, as such people are more willing to talk about their experiences. Now, debriefing officers were recommended to seek out potential interviewees as soon as possible after arrival as, quote, once arriving migrants integrate with others in the camp, there is a tendency for them to become more reluctant to cooperate, end quote. So there are apparently no instructions on what to do regarding any possible need for medical attention or for legal information for any claims for protection. In responding to these revelations, Chris Jones, who is a researcher with State Watch, said, quote, border guards participating in Frontex operations are undoubtedly aware of the appalling conditions to which migrants and refugees are subjected during their journeys. Yet, these guidelines make no mention of a duty of, of a care or protection, which should be the priorities of an agency that claims it upholds fundamental rights in all of its activities end quotes. And joining us today, we do have uh, Chris Jones here from State Watch. He is also, as, as I said, a researcher where he has worked since 2010. His work examines policing, migration, military and security issues in the UK and in the EU. And Chris, we appreciate you being here. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Uh, Chris, so can we start this off by describing um, what Frontex is, who they are and how you came into be possession of these guidelines? Uh, yeah, I mean, Frontex is the European Union, uh, now it's now officially called the European Union uh, Border and Coast Guard Agency. Uh, Frontex is an abbreviated version of the French um, external, French for external frontiers. Uh, it's basically the EU's border guard, um, which takes part in various operations at the borders of the European Union using uh, border guards seconded to it and police officers seconded to it from European Union member states, um, border agencies. So debriefing officers, border guards, surveillance specialists, and, and so on. Um, the document in question is a set of guidelines which was attached, attached to an operational plan for something called Operation Hera, which is ongoing in the, off the coast of West Africa, uh, between West Africa and the Canary Islands, which is Spanish territory, um, to try and stop people traveling usually in perilous little boats from West Africa to the Canary Islands. Um, an organization based in Berlin called the European Center for Constitutional and Human Rights made a official request for access to documents to Frontex for information related to Operation Hera. Uh, received a lot of documents, included amongst them was this document uh, which contains the information we decided to highlight recently. Um, regarding their treatment of, in their words, isolated or mistreated individuals. So these policies, which explicitly outline the targeting of vulnerable persons and potential victims of violence purely for the purposes of intelligence gathering, makes for some very disturbing reading. So how do you explain the callousness which with uh, these policies appear to be drafted and enacted? Well, um, I mean, human rights groups, um, legal specialists and so on, they've long accused Frontex of being far less concerned with human rights and far more concerned with border control, um, surveillance and the interception of migrants, which is the majority of its mandate. Um, it has something called a consultative forum on fundamental rights, which was set up in 2012. Um, and the, in their reports, they do say since then that Frontex's debriefing guidelines have been altered, but no one knows, apart from them and the agency, to what extent uh, this document dates from 2012. I mean, the, the framework surrounding the drafting of these kind of guidelines is that irregular migration to the European Union is viewed as a sort of criminal phenomenon, which needs to be stopped through the deployment of quasi-military means, um, the deployment of various surveillance systems, fences, dogs, boats, planes, and so on. Um, so the gathering of intelligence 
is seen as necessary to understand the routes that migrants take to reach the European Union and how they, they come to arrive here, uh, whether it be by boat or on foot, um, due to the lack of means available to them to travel legally. So, Chris, in your response to these revelations, you said in part, quote, the purpose of debriefing is to try to counter a problem that is largely a result of the EU's inhumane migration policy. A lack of legal pathways to enter the EU simply boosts the phenomenon of migrant smuggling that our governments say that they are so determined to prevent, end quote. So can you explain further precisely what you mean by that and how is the EU's migration policy responsible for the problems that they are combating? Well, over the last two years, I mean, it's been global news. You've seen hundreds of thousands of people arrive in the European Union. Um, many of them originally were passing through uh, Turkey and they used to travel over land, over the Evros River from Turkey to Greece. Uh, that route was blocked by a large police operations, so people began to travel by sea, which was far more dangerous. Um, people have been traveling across the central Mediterranean, uh, Mediterranean sorry, from, from Libya to Italy or Italian territory islands like Lampedusa for years. Um, there's now a military operation in place to, um, well, in theory, to monitor the coast of Libya and try and understand the smuggling networks. It also serves to, as a rescue operation, when, when migrant boats are, are uh, detected. Uh, and similarly, in, off the coast of West Africa, or between Spain and Morocco, you've had uh, fences and quasi-military patrols set up to deter people uh, from traveling to EU in the first place. The reason they can't do that, like maybe you or I could, by buying a ticket for a ferry or a plane, is that there's something called carrier sanctions in place, thanks to a 2001 law, which says if your transport company, someone tries to get on your plane or your boat and that person doesn't have the right visa or travel document giving them permission to arrive in the destination country, you can't let them on board. And if you do, you'll be fined by uh, the government of the country in which you're operating. Uh, the minute there's a, a debate going on, there's the EU's, what's known as the EU's visa code is being uh, renegotiated to decide the rules on um, visas, permissions for length of stay, conditions for entry and stay and so on. Uh, one part of this, the European Parliament has said that humanitarian visas, you know, there should be provisions for humanitarian visas. If you go to an EU member state embassy in another country and say that I want to apply for a visa and when I get to France or wherever I'd like to apply for asylum, that, that possibility should exist. Um, the Council, which is made up, the Council of the EU, which is made up of the governments of the member states, has said that's a, no way, you know, we're not, we're not interested in that at all. So the fact of the matter is people are desperate, they want to live in safety, you know, these are people travelling from, well, uh, Afghanistan, Syria, uh, Eritrea, Ethiopia, Somalia, you know, there's many reasons why people want to leave their countries and they end up traveling in little boats um, which are unsafe because there's no or very few legal options for them to enter the EU. Uh, this mode of transport is then treated as a criminal phenomenon but the fact of the matter is that it's the policies that exist in the first place instituted by our governments that leave people with no other means other than to use irregular routes. So it's a, it's a sort of circular, a downward spiral in that the EU's policies create more recourse to irregular migration, which they then say they need to clamp down on, which creates more dangerous routes, and so on and so on. Chris, you know, State Watch recently published a report from the European Center for Constitutional and Human Rights entitled Opaque and Unaccountable Frontex Operation Hera. So what is Operation Hera and how is it opaque and unaccountable in your opinion? Um, well, that wasn't my opinion. That was written by two people who work for the uh, ECCHR. But what they said in that report was that um, they, they're a legal human rights charity, uh, carry out strategic litigation and such like. And uh, after a workshop related to Operation Hera, uh, they applied for a set of documents from Frontex relating to the operation, operational plans, uh, evaluations and analysis relating to Operation Hera. Uh, and received very little back. I received a lot of documents, most of which were uh, censored with large sections blacked out. 
Um, the one we have highlighted contains this section regarding guidelines on targeting isolated or mistreated, quote, people for interviews. Uh, there was also large other sections in that report which had not been censored properly by the agency's documents department and so they could be uncensored so to say which has actually happened before um, there were reports released to american journalists um, about 200 ser serious incident reports which involved um, border guards operating during during frontex operations who had fired at refugees boats um, which resulted in migrants, refugees being killed, uh, injured, and in some cases killed. Uh, and he received 200 odd of these reports, which he was able to remove all the uh, censoring from, um, which enabled him to see what had actually been happening, which arguably is very much in the public interest and not against the interests of national security were that information to be released. So how would you describe the current treatment of refugees fleeing violence, war, and economic collapse? Uh, appalling. Um, <laughs> I mean, there's, there's the governments of the European Union seem to have largely come to a consensus that enough is enough and we want as few people as possible to arrive um, in the future. Um, just today it was reported that the Italian government, the Italian interior minister, had 10 mayors from um, southern Libyan towns flown to Rome to try the woo, to woo them into cooperating with demands, European demands, to stop people entering in Libya in the first place. Um, the European Commission said it's going to give 200 million euros to Libya to help you know, beef up the border security. The basic idea is we don't want them here. You know, they're potentially terrorists and, you know, quite frankly, they can stay somewhere else. Um, which, given the image that the EU likes to project of itself as a, you know, the home of human rights and so on, is hypocritical, to say the least. So in December of last year, Yasha Massiano, I hope I'm pronouncing Yasha's name correctly. She's one uh, of Mechanico. Mechanico, thank you very much. She's one of your colleagues from State Watch. Um, she told us that only 5% of the target number of refugees had been relocated by the EU in over a year. So has anything improved since then? Uh, I think the numbers have increased, but not by very much. I mean, this is a scheme that is, has been a failure from the start, basically. Um, that was to move to relocate refugees stuck in Italy and Greece to every member states. All the member states signed up. Some of them had to be dragged to a kicking and screaming, like Hungary and uh, Slovakia and Poland. And none of the member states have met their, their quotas that they agreed to when the legislation was signed. So where do you think the EU refugee policy is headed over the coming 12 to 24 months, and why? Well, throwing the Geneva Con Convention in the dustbin. Um, <laughs> um, the minute the it seems that the deal that was done with Turkey um, give lots of money to refugee initiatives in Turkey in exchange for um, the Turkish border guards and coast guard blocking exit from Turkey and taking back anyone who does arrive on the Greek islands that's seen as being a great success and in some way people would like to replicate that with uh, North African countries, particularly Libya, which is now where most irregular journeys to the EU depart from. Um, it seems to be largely based on bribing North African and uh, Sub-Saharan Sahel countries in various ways, saying, you know, unless you comply with our migration demands, we'll cut development aid. Uh, if you do what we want, then, you know, you can have this, this and this. Uh, it's basically outsourcing the EU's responsibility for people who are seeking protection. Now, in the first place, people shouldn't have to, you know, put their lives at risk traveling in little boats to come to Europe. And ideally, you know, people would be able to claim asylum in countries close to their countries of origin. But the reason this, what's now referred to as the refugee crisis, began nearly two years ago now is because people from the Syrian war and other conflicts in the Middle East had spent so long waiting in awful conditions they'd had enough and they thought you know I don't want my children to grow in a refugee camp in Jordan I'll go to Europe it 
it's the, the continent of human rights and uh, asylum, and I'll try and start a new life there. Uh, but it's this is a very long, it's a very long sort of long policy trajectory. It's the the EU's policies on this have long been very hardline for a decade or more, two decades, um, and it's based towards the ideas of externalisation and someone else taking care of the problems that we don't want to see. So what are people doing and what, if anything, can people do that you think could help change the direction of the current policy and actually provide humanitarian assistance to refugees? Well, one of the most uh, inspiring things about the last two years is the amount of people who have, you know, gone out to Greek islands or to Calais in France or to the border between France and Italy where people are blocked from traveling from Italy to France uh, and, you know, begun to do things for themselves to provide aid and support to people and translation and legal advice and all these other things, um, which governments have either been unwilling or unable to, to do. Um, I mean, ultimately, the, the policies need to change and uh, a whole lot of other things, arguably, you know, the conditions, what the people, the people flee in the first place, um, need to be ameliorated and improved. Um, in the short term, it's, it's a question, I suppose, of some of those organisations or movements and groups that have arisen to support refugees over the last two years being able to come together and assert political demands in a more organized way. Indeed, we have been speaking with Chris Jones. He is a researcher for State Watch, where he has worked since 2010. His work examines policing, migration, military and security issues in the UK and in the EU. We have been discussing the European Union's treatment of migrants and immigrants um, coming to the area and whether or not some of their tactics uh, are less humane in the interest of intel intelligence gathering. So Chris, we appreciate you joining us today. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. And thanks for watching The Real News Network.